Um, and before I introduce uh, Dr. Collins, uh, let me also thank our co-sponsors, the New Hampshire Public Health Association and New Hampshire Medical Society who have helped uh, put this session on. So with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Amy Collins, who is uh, currently the Senior Clinical Advisor for Physician Engagement at, the healthcare, at healthcare Without Harm. And tonight she's gonna to be presenting on climate, health, and healthcare, how health professionals can help. Um, Dr. Collins is an emergency physician in the Boston suburbs and a sustainable healthcare professional. She founded the Sustainability Committee at Metro West Medical Center in 2007 and led the sustainability efforts there for seven years. Under her leadership, Metro West Medical Center received numerous environmental excellence awards from Practice Green Health, including the Environmental Leadership Circle Award, the most prestigious award offered. She also worked as a sustainable healthcare consultant for Vanguard Health Systems and implemented sustainability programs at Vanguard's 26 hospitals nationwide. She now serves as a senior clinical advisor for physician engagement for healthcare without harm, leading their physician network with a goal to support physicians and medical students who are interested in promoting climate smart healthcare and other climate solutions. Dr. Collins, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. I'm assuming you can all see that. Well, thank you again so much for having me. Um, I really do enjoy in, um, talking to fellow health professionals, um, especially those so close to me in Massachusetts. Um, well, my slides are not advancing. Okay. So I'm going to start with sharing a story about how I got involved in this work. It was back in 2007, and I was in the school pickup line waiting to pick up my fourth grade son. I was idling and texting and listening to music, and my son came out to the car, opened the car door, and immediately reprimanded me for idling. He told me that that day his teacher had read him a story about climate change and the impact it was having on polar bears. He told me he was concerned and he made me promise that I would never idle again and that I would do more about climate change. I did agree. Um, I made that promise to him, but the truth is I really didn't know much at all about climate change. My only point of reference at that time was the documentary Inconvenient Truth. And that night we watched it as a family. And as a family, we made a decision that we would do what we could at home. And we did all sorts of things from energy audits to energy efficiency to a backyard garden, drying our clothes outside on a clothesline. And it soon became very uncomfortable living one way at home and another way at work. And I started to wonder why I left my environmental conscious at the door when I walked in for a shift. Um, I'd wonder at seven o'clock in the morning when there were no patients there, why all the lights were on and TVs were on. And it became increasingly uncomfortable. I asked someone if I could start a recycling program and I was told that recycling was illegal in a hospital. And I went to Google and I learned that not only was recycling not illegal, but that healthcare had a very big impact, was contributing to the climate crisis and there was a lot more a hospital could do. So at that moment, I knew I had found my midlife um, passion and career transition. I got educated. I wrote a letter to my administration asking for permission to start a recycling program and a sustainability committee. And I was given almost instant approval. It's not always that easy, but in my case, it was the right ask of the right administration at the right time. So I led the sustainability team. Um, at my two hospital health system in the suburbs of Boston for about seven to eight years. Uh, we had a director level team and we achieved all sorts of great things from energy efficiency, waste reduction, a lot of a community and employee engagement, a lot of work in the OR, um, a lot of food programs. And to this day, it remains the highlight of my career. It was just fun, impactful, very inspirational work. I no longer do that. I now work for 
um, Healthcare Without Harm, which is a global organization um, founded in 1996 by Gary Cohen, who is a, a, a Massachusetts and Boston native. Um, and we are a global organization um, with a goal to transform the worldwide healthcare sector so that it reduces its environmental footprint and becomes a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. Um, our reach is uh, 44,000 hospitals and health centers in 72 countries worldwide. We have branches in four continents. Um, I want to start by say, just saying that uh, Healthcare Without Home started with an initial campaign to do two, uh, two campaigns. One, to close down medical waste incinerators, which at that time, many were hospital waste and were a um, great contributor of mercury emissions. And our other campaign was to eliminate mercury from the healthcare sector. Um, some of you who are older like me know that we used to have a lot of mercury in healthcare. It's a potent neurotoxin. Um, this campaign started with the return of one mercury containing thermometer at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston and led to a successful campaign to eliminate mercury from the US healthcare sector and pharmacy chains um, and culminated in a treaty being signed in um, 2017, um, agreeing to phase out mercury from the um, global healthcare sector. We have many program areas, energy, waste, the OR, transportation, water, buildings, food. Um, however, our current focus is on climate smart healthcare. Um, we're um, a organization with many um, organizations that are part of us. Um, we can be perceived as somewhat of a con confusing organization. Um, we are a network of organizations. Practice Green Health is our US-based membership organization. Our worldwide um, network organization is Global Green and Healthy Hospitals. And we have a group purchasing organization which allows hospitals and health systems to buy environmentally prefer preferable um, supplies and devices um, called Green Health Exchange. So why as an organization are we focused on climate and climate smart healthcare? Um, there are many reasons. Um, I think you all know that climate is a public health crisis um, and we're running out of time. Um, I think a lot of times when people talk about climate change and health, they focus exclusively on the health impacts of climate change, but we have a broader focus. Um, we're concerned about climate change because we know that um, climate-driven extreme weather events can impact healthcare delivery, access, and supply chains. Um, we also know that our sector makes a major contribution to the climate crisis. Um, we also know that the single largest factor driving healthcare pollution emissions is clinical care, the care that we provide. Um, we also know that health professionals can be very um, powerful public health advocates um, for climate solutions using health messaging. And like with everything Healthcare Without Harm does, we wanna make sure that our healthcare operations um, are not contributing to environmental pollution, the climate crisis, and you know, ultimately the diseases we treat because we feel this is in keeping with the um, oath to do no harm. So I'm gonna briefly touch on these reasons. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the health impacts of climate change, um, just because we don't have the time, and I assume many of you know about that already. Um, I want to say that back at, in 2009, The Lancet referred to climate as the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. And um, in uh, 2021, leading up to COP, the World Health Organization also referred to climate change as the single belt biggest health threat facing humanity. Um, so, um, you know, there, and the other thing I want to say is that there is global um, agreement in the medical and health community that climate change is a public crisis and that climate action is, is really health action. Um, on Labor Day this year, more than 200 health and medical journals around the world simultaneously published an editorial um, calling for urgent action on the climate crisis to protect health. So I think that's important in communications with um, people about um, 
why we need to take climate action is that there really is um, incredible agreement in the health and medical community that climate change um, is a health crisis. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how climate change um, driven extreme weather events um, impact um, health and healthcare delivery and patients. Um, extreme weather events, as I think you all know, are increasing in severity and frequency. In 2020, we had a record-breaking number of extreme weather events, each one causing a billion dollars in damages, not including the health costs. Um, and 2021 was also a year of um, many um, extreme weather disasters. So these extreme weather events can have impact on health um, due to injuries, fatalities, mental health impacts. They can also cause um, you know, forced migration. They can cause um, people to have to leave their home. This is something that I saw in a patient of mine. This was back in 2017. I was working a Sunday evening shift in an emergency department when a 72 year old woman presented um, directly from Logan Airport. Um, this was soon after Hurricane Maria. Um, she had, before the hurricane struck, been diagnosed with lymphoma. She was somehow able to get out of Puerto Rico, flew to Logan Airport, and went directly from the airport to my emergency department. She was requesting chemotherapy, refills of all her medications, and a psychiatric referral. And up until that point, at uh, that point, I had been asked many times to talk about a patient who had been affected by climate change. And I always struggled to talk about a patient who I could say was, you know, definitely and directly their health um, issue was caused by climate change. Um, and this was the first time I realized that, yes, I have a patient that I can talk about who was impacted by climate. And I think we can expect to see more of these patients who their first point of contact in our communities um, is requesting health care. And I think we have to be prepared to provide um, these people the health care that they may need. Um, extreme weather can also impact um, health care infrastructure. Um, I'm going to share a story from Superstorm Sandy back in 2012 in NYU Langone. Um, it's personal for me because I'm a New Yorker. I went to um, NYU for medical school. Um, I know the facility well. Um, but after Superstorm Sandy, there was a 14-foot storm surge that the facility was not built to withstand. Um, 15 million gallons of water flooded the basements and sub-basements in about a half an hour. They lost power, they lost generators. Uh, they had to act, evacuate um, hundreds of patients in the dark through stairwells, um, disrupting their care and transport them to other hospitals throughout the city um, and out of the city, um, again, causing delays and disruptions um, in their care. Um, but the, the impacts did not stop there um, due to the infrastructure damage of the facility. The um, emergency department was closed for 18 months. Uh, surgery was suspended for two, month, uh, for two months. Um, they lost their, um, their lab rodents, um, which were special rats that had been carefully bred. Um, and ultimately it caused over 500 providers at NYU Langone to seek privileges at other facilities because they could not provide the care they needed to care for their patients at their facility. Um, and as you can see, the total costs were over 1.1 billion with an estimated loss of revenue of over $400 million. Um, so Healthcare Without Harm works with hospitals and health facilities to make sure that they um, are built and operated so that they can stay open and um, operational um, during and after extreme weather events. Um, extreme weather can also impact access to healthcare. Um, utilities may be down. Um, communication systems may be down, so people might not be able to, you know, call 911 to get an ambulance. Um, and um, transportation um, can be disrupted, wires can be down, um, streets can be flooded. The photo I share is from an ambulance in Colorado, it was a BLS ambulance going to meet an ALS ambulance that got caught in floodwaters. 
um, one of my colleagues shares a story about a hospital in um, Texas who was impacted by extreme weather. Um, and they rebuilt and they were climate resilient and ready um, to accept patients. However, the community um, was not prepared to get patients to the hospital. Um, and even though they were open um, and ready for patients, patients could not access the hospital. So I think it speaks to the fact that um, healthcare resilience really requires community resilience. Um, and that people have to be able to um, access the facilities um, during and after extreme weather. Um, ex uh, this, I wanna share a story about extreme weather that hit close to home right here in New England. Um, this is, uh, these are photos um, from a flood at Norwood Hospital, which is about 13, 14 miles from where I'm sitting now back at the end of June of 2020, so almost two years ago, there was a historic rainstorm, which caused flooding of the hospital in a very short period of time, um, causing patients to be um, evacuated. Um, this hospital is still not open. It's almost two years later, and this hospital is still not open. But this event has impacted um, patients and colleagues of mine in a number of ways. The first um, way I learned that this event was going to impact my patient is we learned that patients who are having STEMIs or heart attacks who needed to go to the cath lab may potentially be transported to my hospital. My hospital is Metro West Medical Center. Um, and you can see the Norwood community is south of us. And if you look at the times I share, this is a Google screenshot, not taken at rush hour. This was taken um, you know, at a time when there is no traffic. You can see it can take as long as you know, 39 minutes for someone from the Norwood community to get to my hospital. And I think um, those of us who are healthcare providers know that when someone is having a heart attack and needs to go to the cath lab, but time is of essence. Um, so this is an example of how, um, you know, patient's care um, was disrupted um, because their facility was not open. Um, I soon after that had another patient present to my emergency department. Um, again, um, on a weekend evening, he was an older non-English speaking gentleman. Um, all we knew is that he had had, um, you know, bladder and kidney surgery. We knew he was previously followed at Norwood Hospital. That's where all his providers were. That's where his surgery was. And he was complaining of feeling fatigued and blood in his urine. In a normal situation, we would call the other hospital and get medical records, but there was no hospital to call. So we were able to care for this patient, but with very limited information. He was anemic. We were not able to find out if that was his baseline hematocrit or if he had had acute blood loss. And we were able to care for him, but again, with very little information. And I think it's another example of how this patient was not able to access his healthcare facility, um, sought treatment at another facility, and it presented some challenges um, in his care. And finally, this event has impacted colleagues of mine. Um, a former emergency medicine colleague of mine was due to start as the medical director of that emergency department on July 1st. He found himself um, without a job, um, without work for six months, um, as did all the providers there. They found themselves out of work. And to this day, we still have a couple of surgeons who are affiliated at that hospital who do not have um, their practice anymore. They do not have an OR to operate on and they are moonlighting as my hospital um, and they refer to themselves as Norwood refugees. Um, the, these extreme weather events can also impact healthcare supply chains. Um, also uh, after Hurricane Maria, um, we um, had a critical shortage of normal saline IV fluid bags in the US because the two major manufacturing plants um, were located in Puerto Rico and were destroyed. Um, and we also saw um, critical shortages of pharmaceuticals, um, medical devices, and surgical supplies and devices because those manufacturing plants were also in Puerto Rico. So these extreme weather events you know, far away from 
us or home um, can affect healthcare right here at our home institutions. Um, now I'm going to turn to um, the climate impact of the healthcare sector. Um, the U.S. healthcare sector has a large outsized climate footprint. Um, the healthcare sector is responsible for 8.5% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. We know this from the work of Jody Sherman, um, who is an anesthesiologist, and her research partner, Matt Eckelman. We know that US, um, U.S. healthcare emissions are the highest per capita in the world, and the U.S. is the first in terms of healthcare greenhouse gas emissions, responsible for 27% of the global healthcare footprint. We know that emissions are rising. We know that um, healthcare-associated pollution um, and emissions um, are responsible for the same public health harm um, as medical errors. And also we know that the majority of healthcare emissions are scope three emissions, and we're gonna talk about that in a bit, and largely come from the massive healthcare supply chain, the procurement of food and pharmaceuticals, devices and supplies. 8.5% um, may not sound like a large number, but to put it in perspective, if the US were ranked as a country, as a nation for healthcare emissions, we would rank 13th in the world for emissions, so more than the entire United Kingdom. So I think this is a nice visual of just how large um, the US healthcare footprint is. So why does healthcare have uh, such a large uh, footprint? Basically, every single healthcare activity generates admissions. Um, from the energy we use to operate buildings, um, from the waste we generate, how our waste is transported and ultimately disposed of. We've talked about the supply chain. Um, hospitals have many fleet vehicles. Um, our ORs are particularly um, climate intensive and have um, unique impacts such as anesthetic gases, um, which for those of you who don't know, are used to put people to sleep during procedures. They are potent anesthetic gases. The two most potent ones are desfluorine and nitrous oxide. Um, and there's been an increasing trend um, in ORs led by anesthesiologists to um, eliminate the use of those two potent greenhouse gases. Um, hospitals are often the largest restaurant in a community, serving many patient employee meals a day, many containing meat. Um, hospitals generate lots of um, food waste, um, and we have patients and employees um, commuting to the hospital. So basically, every single healthcare activity generates emissions. Um, I said I would talk about scope three emissions. Um, there are three different um, scopes of emissions according to the um, greenhouse gas protocol. Um, scope one emissions are emissions generated on site from on site energy use, cooking, refrigerants. Um, the one um, scope um, one gas relevant to collision is waste anesthetic gases are considered scope one. Scope two um, emissions are indirect. Um, emissions from purchase, purchase sources of power, such as purchase electricity and steam. And scope three is the largest source of emissions and it's everything else. It is our procurement of our medical devices and supplies, pharmaceuticals. The US is very pharmaceutical intensive. Um, it's our procurement of meat, it's our waste disposal, it's employee commutes, it's business travel. And I like to show this because I think it communicates to clinicians that we have an opportunity to reduce healthcare emissions by working on those scope three things. We can look at our pharmaceutical prescribing practices. Um, you know, how many refills do we give? Could a patient um, benefit from a non-pharmaceutical treatment instead of a, you know, giving a prescription? Um, can we make decisions about um, the medical devices we use, such as choosing a reusable device, such as a laryngoscope over a single use disposable? Um, so I think it is a good visual um, and a way to understand that scope three emissions are the largest source of emissions, but it is um, a scope in which we can work as healthcare professionals. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we call the unsustainable cycle of healthcare, um, um, acute and chronic 
conditions and um, injuries cause healthcare utilization, um, which causes emissions and pollution, which goes on to um, cause public health harm and more healthcare utilization. A colleague of mine used to say that the greenest healthcare is the healthcare that never happens. Um, and I think what's important to understand is if we really want to reduce healthcare admissions, we're going to have to decrease healthcare utilization, especially hospital utilization, because hospitals have such a big impact. And there really needs to be on uh, a be a focus on preventative care to try to keep people healthy and out of the healthcare system. Um, fortunately, there are many, many ways to take action, which are beyond the scope of this talk. Um, hospitals can work on energy efficiency, procuring renewable energy, waste man man management program, um, reusing medical devices, um, taking action to reduce the impact of the OR, choosing local and sustainable food. Um, we refer to um, all these strategies as climate smart healthcare. Um, climate smart healthcare is defined as low carbon resilient healthcare. Um, a climate smart healthcare not all, only wants to reduce its climate footprint, but it wants to, um, uh, it should be built and operated in a way that it's climate resilient and can stay open and operational um, during extreme weather. Um, this is from a, um, a report um, uh, published by Healthcare Without Harm um, and the World Bank, and it really outlines a series of data-driven evidence-based strategies um, that you can see here for hospitals to reduce its um, climate footprint. Um, so how do we get this all done? Um, I work for the um, Healthcare Without Climate Healthcare Without Harm Climate and Health Program. We support the US um, healthcare sector in a three pillar strategy, mitigation, um, uh, resilience and leadership. So we work with hospitals to reduce their carbon footprint, again, build climate smart resilient facilities and also to mobilize um, the healthcare sector's influence, its ethical, economic, and political influence to advance climate solutions um, at the, you know, the, the local, state, um, and federal level. Um, we really want healthcare to have a seat at the table um, and advocate for climate solutions using um, you know, a health um, framework. Um, and communicate that um, climate action really is um, health action. Um, we have a number of programs and initiatives and resources to uh, help hospitals become climate smart through our Healthcare Climate Challenge, which is a global um, challenge that hospitals and health systems can sign up um, for, um, which supports hospitals in achieving climate goals, again, through this three pillar um, strategy, we have a climate action um, playbook, which is examples from leading hospitals, how they've operated, operationalized climate solutions. Um, we really have no shortage of tools and resources to help hospitals meet their goals. We also, um, you know, can't do it alone. I mentioned earlier that climate is an organizational priority. And many of our program areas um, are focused on um, um, climate. Um, one example is our Healthy Food and Healthcare Program, um, which um, has a three pillar climate friendly food strategy. Um, they work with hospitals to serve less meat. I think you probably all know that meat has a, a big climate footprint, um, working hospitals um, to serve less meat and better meat. Um, working with um, facilities to reduce food waste um, and on sustainable food purchasing strategies. Um, one of the ways we do that is through our Cool Food Pledge, um, which is an initiative for hospitals to um, serve more plant-based foods as a way to reduce emissions. Um, little plug for a hospital in New Hampshire, Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, is one of our um, hospitals and health systems that is participating in the Cool Food Pledge. 
Um, we also um, do it through working um, with our sustainable procurement team. Um, we have a number of guides um, to help hospitals procure, procure um, environmentally preferable um, you know, products and supplies, um, including supplies um, that have less of a climate footprint, um, along with um, a number of other um, um, toolkits and calculators. And I mentioned before, we also have a group purchasing organization um, for hospitals to um, purchase their supplies through. We also do it through Practice Green Health, which is our US-based membership and networking organizations that supports hospitals in implementing their sustainability goals. Um, each of these circles is one of the impact areas, you know, from climate to chemicals, to electricity, to the OR, to food. Um, and within each of those impact areas, um, we provide tools and resources and education and networking opportunities. Um, um, we don't have a lot of members in New Hampshire. Um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is a member, as is Concord Hospital. I think that gives you lots of opportunity um, to try to engage your hospitals and health systems um, and, and make the pitch to them for sustainable health care, um, you know, and the value of um, belonging to an organization that can support um, your institution and meeting its goals. So if you're interested in finding out if your hospital is a member, contact me, or if you want to support making the pitch for membership to your leadership, um, you know, please also contact me. Um, I often get asked um, or hear the argument that greening healthcare is expensive. I think it's important if you are going to be um, talking about this to your leadership, that you understand the business case for sustainable health care. The business case is very strong um, from increased employee engagement, retention, and recruitment, um, improved community reputation, um, but the cost savings um, can be significant. This is data from our annual awards program, which is a data-driven award application from which we generate um, our annual benchmark report. And this is cost savings from these initiatives from our um, data a couple of years ago. And we found that hospitals that implemented these initiatives saved on average over 1.1 million for facility, um, with a lot of those savings coming from the operating room, you know, over 45,000 per operating room. So again, I think it's important to understand the business case um, if you're going to be speaking to healthcare executives. Um, I like to share this study in my presentation because I think it's really powerful of um, what the collective impact could be. This is a study that we did um, back in 2012. Um, again, using data from our awards program, we looked at our highest performing hospitals and health systems and their cost savings in these four areas, um, energy use, waste segregation, um, reprocessing, uh, reprocessing of um, single-use devices in the OR and reformulating OR kits. Um, and we then extrapolated the data to um, estimate the savings if every hospital in the US performed at that level and saved at that level. And we estimated that the savings over five years would be 5 billion to the US healthcare sector and 15 billion over 10 years. And there's not a healthcare executive in this country um, or anywhere whose ears aren't going to perk up if you can share um, data like that with them. We also get um, um, the job done by engaging clinicians, um, healthcare without harm and practice green health are very committed to clinician engagement. We recognize the value of clinician leadership. You know, why is that? We know that um, uh, clinicians are trusted year after year. Nurses um, are the most trusted profession, um, according to the Gallup poll and others. Doctors have risen higher on the list. Um, pharmacists are also trusted, and we can really leverage that trust um, and leverage our influence as healthcare providers um, to communicate the imperative of transitioning towards climate smart healthcare um, to our leaders um, at the hospital and to policymakers. 
Um, increasingly, medical societies are um, calling on clinicians to take climate action and recognizing that healthcare has a big climate input, uh, impact and calling on clinicians um, to lead action to reduce that impact. Um, and again, I talked about this briefly before, um, our clinical care, the care that we provide um, is one of the largest drivers of healthcare emissions. And there are plenty of opportunities to look at the care we provide, try to reduce um, unnecessary testing, low value um, you know, procedures and testing, um, and look at our clinical choices, choices and reduce that, um, that clinical impact. Um, we support clinicians in a number of ways. The way we support nurses is through our Nurses Climate Challenge, um, which um, started as a national campaign. It's now global. Um, the goal in the U.S. is to mobilize um, 50,000 for nurses to educate 50,000 health professionals on the impacts of climate change um, by the end of 22, 2022, and they are on track to meet that goal. I encourage you to um to tell um you know nursing colleagues um about this um campaign um they provide um nurses with um plenty of research resources talking points um sample presentations and many other um supporting materials um i lead the healthcare without harm physician network which is a national network of physicians who's and medical students um, and some PAs um, whose primary interest is in taking action um, to reduce the environmental impact of healthcare delivery um, and promoting climate smart healthcare. Um, we have a couple of cohort groups, one for residents and fellows, another one for surgeons. And our radiologist cohort group is absolutely on fire. Um, they are doing absolutely remarkable um, work um, and their momentum has just been um, so inspirational to see. Um, so I encourage any of you who are interested to check us out. Um, we exist to support you. We're free and there's no obligation. Um, and I encourage you to um, connect with our you know, fabulous network of physicians and medical students and others if you're interested. Um, I want to share that we have a, um, if you're interested in this, we have a couple of upcoming virtual events. Um, we have a climate um, health and healthcare journal club. Um, our next session is um, on April 7th. Um, it'll be led by our radiologists and we are going to be discussing a paper related to the impact um, of um, radiology um, imaging. Um, we also have um, an upcoming uh, discussion session from our um, residency and fellow group. Um, and that session is going to be a week today, from today, and it's going to be an update on climate smart healthcare. And we are also hosting um, another discussion session about um, anesthetic gases um, and how you can. Um, take action to reduce them in your facility. Um, we also have um, a grand round series. We have partnered with the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia um, University in New York. Um, and this is a um, clinician and researcher um, led grand round series. Um, and our goal is to educate um, our audience about, you know, strategies to reduce healthcare admission, um, you know, opportunities to bring climate smart healthcare to the bedside, and emerging research that um, supports healthcare decarbonization. Um, our next session is June in June, um, also led by radiologists. Um, I think sustainable radiology is the next hot topic um, in sustainable healthcare, um, and they'll be leading that session. Um, next, um, our annual conference is in Clean Med. Um, we are going to gather in person um, if COVID cooperates um, for the first time in a couple of years in Kansas City. Um, it, it's a great opportunity um, to network with people who are doing this work, um, meet the sustainability community, and get educated 
Um, for any of you who are um, medical students, residents, or fellows, we offer um, all of you student pricings um, as a way to make it more affordable because um, we would love to have um, you join us. Um, I want to close by saying that in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, all sectors need to reduce um, emissions by 45% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Healthcare does not get a pass. Healthcare is not exempt from this charge. You know, healthcare needs to do its part. Um, this is a um, report released last fall by Healthcare Without Harm in partnership with Arup, which um, charts a course to net zero healthcare emissions by 2050, and it outlines the key action that every healthcare facility and hospital around the world not, needs to take if we are going to achieve net zero emissions and do our part. And that's really gonna require the co cooperation of every health professional from the boardroom to the kitchen, to the OR, to the radiology room, to the emergency department. You know, we all have a role in helping to reduce um, healthcare emissions. Um, so, you know, how do we get this done? I think it's beyond the scope of this talk, but this is how, um, you know, I organize um, the opportunities for um, physicians and other clinicians to take action, um, really using that climate smart healthcare lens. Um, you know, you can take action within the four walls of your hospital or health system. You can start a project. You can start, um, you know, taking action in your department, such as the OR. You can join a sustainability team, start a sustainability team, make the pitch to your leadership. Um, you could look at your clinical practice, which we've talked about a lot. Um, there is certainly need for more healthcare emissions research, and increasingly, um, there are both medical students, um, residents, and um, physicians, along with researchers who are engaging in this type of research. Um, I think we have opportunity to educate um, communities and colleagues about the um, climate impact of the healthcare sector through the media by podcasts, writing blogs, letters to the editor, op-eds. Um, there are endless opportunities for more education. We need to get this content in the medical school and residency curriculum post um, graduate training. Um, we need more grand rounds. We need to get this content into conferences. Um, and again, we can ad advocate for public policies um, that not only, um, you know, um, reduce healthcare emissions, but we want policies that um, are going to, you know, promote resilience. Um, so what can you do? I know this is very overwhelming and um, it's hard to know where to get started, but I think, you know, a good way to start is um, just get educated. Um, there are, you know, resources and websites um, to learn about this. Um, happy to share my, um, my resource um, list with you. You can sign up for um, one of our many newsletters if this is of interest to with you. Um, I encourage you to connect with the sustainability community. It's a great community of people. You could do that by joining the Physician Network or one of our cohort groups or the Nursing Climate Challenge or some other group. Um, if you're a clinician, um, I challenge you to start looking for the impacts and opportunities. Once you start seeing them, you're not gonna stop seeing them. They're everywhere. Um, evaluate your clinical practice. Um, Look at your clinical practice, you know, through a, um, a climate lens um, and start making choices um, that reduce your climate impact. Um, you know, of course, keeping, you know, patient safety and quality of care in mind, but we, we know that we can reduce healthcare's impact without reducing um, quality or safety. Um, I think one of the most important things you can do is talk about this um, from casual conversations um, to conversations um, on rounds, um, but you know, talk about this and you know, just start by maybe committing to one thing. 
Um, I want to talk uh, close by talking about hope. Um, we do have some reasons for hope. Um, the National Academy of Medicine has formed the Action Collaborative on decarbonizing the healthcare sector. This is a public-private partnership um, of high-level leaders um, who are working to address the sector's environmental impact. Um, there are leaders from JACO and the American Hospital Association. Um, you know, AMA, CMS. Um, so I think we can expect to see um, some action and um, um, resources and recommendations come out of that. Um, and also at COP, um, um, Admiral Rachel, Dr. Rachel Levine um, from HHS um, um, committed the US to the COP26 health program and um, committed that the US um, healthcare sector um, would build low carbon resilient um, health systems um, and do their part. And they're gonna do that starting with federal facilities. Um, the other thing that gives me hope is clinicians, um, is, um, particularly the medical students and residents I work with. When I started doing this work in 2007, I was very much alone. When I went to my first clean med conference, I was the only physician there. And this work and engagement has absolutely exploded. Um, and that really gives me so much hope that there are so many nurses and medical students and residents and physicians who are willing to do this work in addition to the demands of um, clinical work. And it really inspires me and gives me hope. Um, I just want to close. Um, a, um, you know, you know, my son is the one who inspired me. Um, that was back in 2007. Um, I think we know that youth are still asking adults to take climate action. I still do this work for my son and the other children um, in my life. Um, I just wanna close by talking about the power of just doing one thing. A lot of people say to me that they don't wanna get started. And I tell them just do one thing because you never know where that one thing is gonna lead. And what I tell them that this was one teacher who read one classroom, a story about climate change and polar bears that inspired one boy who inspired one mom. Um, and then I was able to inspire you know, my CEO. And then, you know, it led to this physician initiative. And I never imagined, you know, that time I made the promise to my son, you know, that time I asked my CEO if I could start a program that it would lead to, you know, something much bigger. So I encourage all of you to um, find your one thing um, and see where it goes. And I think that is it. So thank you very much.